thank all of you for being here, and I would like to thank Jill Van Beek for inviting me to speak, and you for sticking around. <clears throat> thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Abby. I apologize for the voice. It's near the end of the day, and I've been yelling all day. <clears throat> a couple of things. Abby mentioned uh, the fact that this is a place where people uh, come or move or flock. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you there's two such people in this building right now. One is sitting back there, I think, Rick Monroe. He's been at Bandit for, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, Rick chose to move here. Rick is one of those people. Rick's from the Northeast, spent a lot of time in, in Detroit. For those of you that are old enough, anybody remember the rock band Kiss? Well, Rick's sitting back there. He looks like George Clooney, but much older. Uh, Rick was with Kiss from day one to the first time they retired in 86 and took the makeup off. So he's a, a real successful guy that's toured the world and could live anywhere he wanted to, to live. But where did Rick choose to live? Well, here in Knoxville. Uh, in the other room sitting behind the light boards, another gentleman that's been uh, at Bandit for 25 years, his name's Will Tork. Uh, Will's been with everybody from Ted Nugent to Dan Fogelberg to uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash to Brian Wilson and in between. Willie's from Detroit, moved to Los Angeles, and eventually chose to move where? Here to Knoxville, Tennessee. We have probably 100 people that fit that mold. So to what you said, Abby, this is a great place for, uh, for entrepreneurs, but more than that, it's a great place for quality of life. The thing that people come to hear when I speak most is, is there some kind of secret? Is there some kind of magic bullet? Is there some kind of thing you can tell me? And there really isn't. One thing I can tell you is that no entrepreneur you met, and I'll use names that you know, Jim Haslam, Jim Clayton, Pete DeBusk, uh, people in this area who have made a phenomenal difference, uh, Sharon Price, a lot of great people in this community. Not one of those people did it for money. They didn't do it for money. Those of us, and probably you that are entrepreneurs, you do it for the challenge and you do it for the success, but you never do it for the money. And when you get to the top of one mountain, you look for the top of the next mountain. And you know what? The money comes as you do that. Most people that focus on the financial outcome and that alone uh, end up not succeeding. People ask me again quite frequently to summarize you know, what I think it takes to get to the top. For me, it's very simple, and it's the word OLD. And if anyone's heard me speak, you've probably heard that. Uh, in your life, you will have opportunity. There'll be a ton of luck, and then you've got to have incredible dedication. For all of these men and women that, that spoke today, They've got to believe in themselves. So I'm going to start with the D, the dedication. When you believe in yourself and when you talk to people and when people leave knowing that you believe in yourself, they might invest in you. But why would they invest in you if you don't believe in yourself? And I coach people, young and old, all the time about that because I meet with people that want advice or, or want to get into business or want to learn something. And if that person is sitting there going, well, I've got a really good product. Yeah, I think it could do wonderful, but I'm just not sure. Uh, they're like Droopy the dog, and I'm just sitting there going, Jesus, what is this all about? Because clearly if this individual doesn't believe in what he or she is doing, why should I? So you've got to have dedication and you've got to believe in yourself because quite simply, if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. Now let's go back to the whole opportunity and luck thing. Uh, anybody that's been successful from Bill Gates on down, and by the way, I could have bought and sold Bill Gates in 1974. Uh, he was still in his parents' basement working on software, but it worked out pretty good for Bill. The, uh, the opportunities come your way. You've got to seize those opportunities. But more importantly, and people argue with me about this, you've got to have a ton of luck for those opportunities to come your way and to deal with them correctly. And again, I get into long conversations with people that go, well, that's not true. Let me give you three or four examples that, that created my life. And, and some of these, you've, some of you are not old enough to understand because you won't know the names. But in 1976, I just finished some shows in Las Vegas with Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn, walked into a bar 
to get a beer and here was this old guy sitting there playing guitar and he told me he was going to be a country star and we struck up a conversation and I agreed to work with him when he became a star and we shook hands and I left. But I no more believed that he would be a country star than this bottle of water would. When I got back home, I began talking to the gentleman that promoted most of the country shows in America at the time. And he said, you know, this cat in Vegas, I think he's going to do something. And I explained to him that we had met. So together we went out and, and worked with this guy. And I gave him a little bitty truck and some lights and some free people and, and you know, spent some money and invested some capital, spent six or eight months. And uh, nine or ten months after that day in Las Vegas, I end up standing in Fort Worth Arena at Tarrant County Convention Center, uh, kicking off Kenny Rogers' first world tour. And I've been with Kenny Rogers ever since. That's 30, I don't know how many years later, a long time later. Uh, fast forward to 1979, 1980, uh, I'm walking past the, ba the brewery on the strip, notice another bar, there's commonality to my story. I go into the brewery and there's a band in there playing called Wild Country. And they come down off the stage and they know who I am because by now Bandit Lights is a name within the industry and they engage me and say the same thing. They say, you know, we want to work with you. And again, I humor them, never believing that anything would come of Wild Country. And they leave, but again, I, I work with them, give them some free lights. And sure enough, about nine months later, they change their name to Alabama. And everything worked out really, really well for us. So then fast forward to 1980, 81, somewhere in there. Same story. I'm in Atlanta with a guy named Dan Fogelberg, who many of you have probably heard of. And when the show's over, this really weird-looking guy comes up to me, and he's just got spiky hair, and he's orange, and he's strange-looking. Same thing. He says, I know who you are. I've seen your flight cases at rock shows, and I want you to work with my band. And he told me the name of his band, and I had never heard of it. So I, I struck up a deal, and we began giving him some free lights and working with him for cheap. And within about six or eight months, a little old band called REM became a big band. Uh, and then the, the last story that I'll tell you was uh, in the late 80s, my Nashville guy called me up and said, there's this little short fat dude uh, came in here and pulled a napkin out with a lighting system bigger than Kiss has ever used. You've got to meet this guy because he thinks he's going to have this. And this guy can't even sell clubs out. So the next time I'm down, I meet this guy and he pulls out this napkin. And, and I too look at it. But again, you don't laugh at anybody until they leave. And uh, so we humored him and agreed to work with him for free, and he took his napkin and left. Well, about nine months later, uh, my Nashville guy and I are standing again in Dallas, at this time at Reunion Arena, and there hanging over the stage is this monolithic light system that this fellow had drawn on a napkin. And we're filming his first television special, which is called This Is Garth Brooks. Uh, again, that all worked out very, very well for me. The commonality to all those stories is I didn't have a damn thing to do with any of that. I was in the right place at the right time. The opportunity presented itself. I was very lucky that it did, but more than that, I knew how to manage the opportunity when it came my way. And that is how you succeed. Uh, you know, you can have all the money in the world. You can have all of the patience in the world. You can have all the belief in yourself in the world, but if you don't manage the situation and manage the opportunity after it's come your way, and you've got to believe it comes your way because of luck. People are forever telling me, no, it's not luck. You, you haven't done what you've done at Bandit because of luck. Yeah, we have. Uh, but, you know, what's the expression? Luck is where opportunity meets something. Preparation, Preparation there we go. Uh, but just remember, OLD, opportunity, luck, and dedication, because if you don't believe in yourself, you will never, ever, ever succeed. Uh, the things that we've been able to do at Bandit, uh, we've been very fortunate. It isn't about me. It's about a team of people. We've got 300 full-time people globally that make the magic happen that we call Bandit Lights. We're very, very fortunate to do that. Uh, we enjoy what we do. I've never had a job. Uh, Andy, a moment ago, Andy Wilhelm from LED North America, uh, was a, a little bit modest. Uh, I'm with him on that endeavor. That's how much I believe in what he's doing. We are the, the strategic partner that he spoke of. When I 
heard what Andy was doing and, and heard what his mission was and heard what he was going, I wanted a piece of that. <laughs> so Bandit and LED North America are now in a, a, a JV, if you will, and we're executing in the arenas. It only makes sense. Why? Because I have people in all the arenas in America almost every day. So we're helping Andy take this product to the next level, and we're very excited about it. And those are the kinds of synergies that come out of this kind of a symposium, uh, that come out of this area. Uh, Andy's endeavor is a result of working with the Oak Ridge National Lab and a particular graphite foam that they created. Uh, I also worked with uh, people at the lab and came up with a couple of other concepts. Uh, all of these LED lights that you see in this room, while they have nothing to do with Andy's or Andy's foam, are a direct result of a collaboration between Bandit Lights and Oak Ridge National Lab. So stick with your guns, believe in yourself, uh, and, and know that you can achieve what you want to achieve uh, when, when all of these elements come together. Uh, I know I've got another hour to speak, and I know that nobody's hungry. <laughs> but, uh, again, I'm glad that this kind of thing is happening. I was just in Nashville over the weekend. Has anyone here been to the Entrepreneur Center? Michael, well, Lawrence was there. Uh, Michael Bertram's got a place called the Entrepreneur Center. I urge you to go see it. It's phenomenal. Uh, Google has endorsed it as a Google Entrepreneur Center. Phenomenal amount of funding that went in there. It's a nice big building full of little incubator rooms and people get together and talk and that's really what this is all about. Uh, to tie back and to stop boring you to tears, Bandit Lights has been very, very successful because of the people and because of the dedication. And when you leave here today, know that you've got to put your nose to the grindstone, you've got to push forward, and when other people are doubting you, you absolutely, positively have to continue to believe in yourself. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak, and thank you all for a great conference. <laughs>